baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is Peter's sermon. This is Paul's preaching. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the message. But you know what nobody ever asked? How do I go to hell? You ever notice that? All through the Bible, people are saying, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? Nobody ever asked, how do you go to hell? You know why? Because all you have to do to go to hell is sin. And since you've already done that, you don't got to do anything else. And if you drift through life, guess where life will drift you towards? Towards hell. Sin is all you have to do to warn hell. And because everyone has sinned, the Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. Jesus Christ had a man come to Him, get on his knees, and He said, Good teacher. And Jesus said, Who are you to call me good? There is none good. Save God alone. And in that, Jesus was not denying His deity, but He was saying, Why would you call a man good? Only God is good. Men are wretched, unrighteous, reprobate sinners who deserve hell. And if we drift along, that is the predetermined destination for those who drift. And it is hell. So we see the first thing the writer tells us. He says, pay close attention to the message so that you don't drift along. The world is drifting. No one in the church should be drifting. The world is headed towards hell. No one in the church should be headed towards hell. The world is drifting right past the dock of salvation and has refused to anchor itself to the anchor of salvation. That should not be with us. With those who are hearing the gospel, it should not be. So we see the first thing the writer says is, pay close attention to what you've heard. And he gives a strong exhortation, don't drift. And then he gives a stern warning, beginning in verse 2. A stern warning. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape? if we neglect such a great salvation. Now I want to break that down for you. I want to make that make sense because it's kind of difficult to get what he's talking about here. What he's saying is that there is a message that was given that proved to be true. He says, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. Now what message in that? Now in the context of this, we have to understand that the message that he's talking about when he says the message delivered by angels, proved to be true. The message he's referring to is the law of God. Now we know, somebody might want to argue and say, well, the law of God was given by God Himself. But it also had angelic mediation. If you want to turn there, Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. says, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from to the ten thousands of His holy ones with flaming. He came rather with ten thousand of His holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Right there, it says that there was angelic mediation in the giving of the law of God. In Acts 7, when Stephen is recounting the history of Israel, he tells them there was angelic mediation in the giving of of the law of God. Thus, we understand in the Hebrew mind, when we talked about the angels, and we talked about the message delivered by angels, in that the Hebrew mind would equate that with the law of God. So the writer is referring to the fact that the law, which came through the mediation of angels, proved itself to be true. He means that every transgression and every disobedience that was set forth in the law proved to be true. How? How did the law prove to be true? The law punished sin. That's how it proved to be true. If someone abided by the law, he was safe. But if a person neglected the law, he was punished. Probably the greatest example of this comes in Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, verse 32. It says, While the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him in custody because it had not been made clear what should be done to him. And the Lord said to Moses, The man shall be put to death. 
All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him to death with stones as the Lord commanded Moses. Somebody might say, oh, well, that's a terrible punishment. Oh, that's such a harsh punishment. All he was was, I mean, all he was doing was picking up sticks. And he got stoned for picking up sticks. What a horrible punishment. Yet here is what the truth is. He broke the law of God knowingly and the law of God demanded punishment. The law had promised punishment. The man knew the crime was against God, yet he continued to neglect it by going out and picking up sticks. So you say, well, how does that story, how does that story go along with Hebrews 2? That man neglected the law of God by going out and picking up sticks, and he was punished. How much more worse will we be if we neglect the salvation that comes in Jesus Christ? Far worse than the physical punishment of being stoned by stones, we will have an eternity in the fires of hell if the salvation that is offered only in Christ is neglected. That's the comparison. This message that was given by angels, it was confirmed in the law of God. How much worse if we neglect the salvation that is in Christ. If you think this punishment for neglecting the law of God is a harsh one, consider how much worse it is for those who neglect the salvation of Christ. Consider the danger for those who hear the message and reject it. Or worse, hear the message and don't care about it. They simply come to church. You say, well, why would anybody come to church if they're not really saved? It happens, folks. People fill the church on Sunday. People come to church every Sunday and have no love for Jesus Christ in their heart. How could that be? Oh, that's too judgmental. I can't even think of something like that. Did not Jesus himself say, On that day many will come unto me and say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, Depart from me, for I never knew you. You know what sermons like this cause us to do? Inner reflect and self-evaluate. Am I really what I say I am? Do I really have the affection for Christ that I say I do? Or do I just go to church to be seen? Do I go to church to have that uh, uh, com community? Would it be just as happy to be Forest Country Club as Forest Christian Church? Is that just as much as important? Or are we here to worship Christ? How shall we escape if we neglect great salvation. Furthermore, how much worse will be the punishment for those who had every opportunity sitting in church 20, 30, 40 years knew they needed to come to Christ yet did not. How shall we escape? The answer is we won't if we neglect coming to Christ, if we neglect yielding to Christ, if we can neglect committing ourselves to Christ, we will not escape the punishment to come. Somebody asked the question, well, why would anyone neglect it? I want to tell you two reasons why people neglect things. If you want to take notes, this is a good point to write this down. There are two reasons why people neglect things. Number one, the value isn't really that great. That's the first reason people neglect things. The value isn't really that great. Uh, you know, not many of you would be excited if there was a contest where you get a year's supply of oven mitt cleanser. You'd probably neglect such a contest because you don't really care about oven mitt cleanser. Well, maybe you do, I don't know, but then the majority, including myself, would neglect such a contest. The value isn't that great. I don't need a year's supply. I don't need a day's supply. I don't own an oven mitt. Yeah, I do, but I don't have any cleanser for it. So the first reason people neglect things is because the value is just not that great. So why has the writer of Hebrews written what he's written because in chapter 1 he's already told us the value is great. He's already told us verses 1 through 14 of chapter 1 this is Jesus Christ who is greater than any angel. 
He's already told us the immense value. He's already given it to us. So He's cut off that reason for neglect. This is a valuable thing. Salvation is the most valuable thing anyone can ever own. It's a gift from God. 